Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the virtual home of Princeton Public Library here on Zoom. My name is Janie Herman, and I am the manager of adult programming at Princeton Public Library. It is my pleasure to be introducing the program this evening, which is an art talk about the flight path installation created by 11 members of the Princeton Artist Directory that is currently on display at the library on our first floor, and it will be up until January 24th. I'm going to be bringing Mary Waltham, one of the founders of the Princeton Artist Directory and the coordinator of this installation on screen in just a few minutes to say a few words prior to the art talk. The art talk has actually been pre-recorded so that each of the artists in the group exhibit is able to discuss their work and you can view the works that they put into the, into the exhibit in detail. Once the recorded portion is over, we will be having uh, eight or nine of the artists that are able to join us on screen afterwards for a discussion and to answer any questions that you may have. For this event this evening, we are encouraging you to ask your questions using the Q&A function or using the chat. And you can direct your questions towards the group or one artist as a whole. With all that being said, I'm gonna ask Mary to turn on her camera and come on screen to say a few words. Hello, thank you very much, Janie, and thanks to Princeton Public Library for hosting this terrific event for us. What you have here this evening is a subgroup of Princeton Artist, Artist Directory. We are a newly formed group of professionally active artists, all living in Princeton, and we range across a number of the arts, including painting, drawing, photography, music, performance, and written and spoken word and poetry. So we're, we're a, a, a very interesting group to have got together. When I was in England during the summer, I became aware of this project, Flight Path, on Instagram. And I saw that there were a lot of images coming up of these little um, small, I don't know if you can see them, concertinas that are black and white and had black marks on them. And clearly there was a, a real flurry of activity around the project. Everyone seemed to having, be having a lot of fun. It was interesting, it was worthwhile. The project raises issues of our pollinators, our insect habitats and human interference. And so it, it's mostly about our invertebrate organisms, which we as humans treat so badly. So I connected with Louisa Crispin, who I'm happy to say is on the call this evening, even though it's after midnight in the UK. She had really, she had the original concept for this idea. And we talked on Zoom, of course, I've, I've never met her face to face. And we hatched the plot to have a satellite event here in Princeton, opening this up to all of the PAD members. And off we went. Each PAD artist who participated, that's all of us, we had one of these little concertinas. You'll see them if you go into the library, you can see what we ended up with. They're really pieces of, of, of stiff paper on which Louisa has made these random marks in graphite really representing many of the barriers that there are to insects in our natural world, wherever we are. The concertina sculptures, these little things, really focus your attention on barriers. And of course, as artists, we had to lay down, we had to put down our imagery, both sides of this, this concertina. Um, and some of the time it felt like squeezing things in which was really a good metaphor for how insects must feel around us much of the time. The size is small, quite intentionally, to focus attention on what it would be like to be an insect. Through, so through a very simple concept, beautifully executed, this project has inspired so many to look at their own environment and reconsider their connections to nature and what we can each do to provide flight paths. And as Louisa Crispin said when I interviewed her, and you're about to see her, I had to overcome some fear and simply get out there and enable the project to live. 
I think it is an important notion for all of us. We can all do something. As of today, over 160 people in the UK have participated. They've worked on these little concertinas, plus the PAD group of 11 artists who you're about to see. Now, our video was recorded in December. Um, the works are all now on display together at the Princeton Public Library. And all the PAD artists' work will be returned to Louisa after the, the, um, the, the display comes down for further exhibition opportunities in the UK. So these will be traveling pieces. They will go back to England uh, to be seen further. That's a general introduction. I wanted you to understand the genesis of the project before we go into what the artists did and how they responded. Thank you, Janie. Thank you so much, Mary, for that wonderful introduction and for, for um, putting in context what we're about to view. Hello and welcome to the Flight Path Community Project Artist Talk hosted by Princeton Public Library. The concept for this innovative community engagement with environmental issues comes from Louisa Crispin, who is an artist based in Kent in the United Kingdom. The video starts with Louisa briefly describing how it all began and continues with each of the Princeton Artist Directory member artists who participated talking about their work. Thank you. I became an artist in 2010 and most of my work is monochrome, drawing with pencil and graphite powder. I started with observational drawings of botanical subjects and nature studies, but primarily interested in insects. The concept of nature corridors was introduced to me by Nikki Gammons, who works for the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, which is a charity in the UK specialising in bumblebees. And I was doing a bumblebee identification course under her tutelage. She introduced us to the dangers of isolating insects and, and other animals in small pockets of areas, things like nature reserves. This that message has been reinforced by the Bug Life Charity, which I think is the equivalent to the Xerxes, Xerxes um, Charity in, in America. They specialize in insects and they've been working on a project called Bee Lines which is about trying to map out throughout the UK three kilometre wide nature corridors, which will enable insects to migrate as climate change changes the environment that we've got here. Uh, we had an enormous wasp nest in our loft. I think you would call them yellow jackets. And I began drawing them. They are exquisitely beautiful creatures. But as I was showing these pictures in various exhibitions, I began to realise that there was an intense dislike towards them and it made me wonder about their purpose. After quite a lot of investigation, I discovered that they are a natural pesticide. So I set about trying to change people's minds, but at the time it was one person at a time. As they came up to my exhibition, as they looked at it and expressed their dislike, I could then inform them about the things that wasps do that are good. It made me realize that I needed to go bigger. So I then just launched it on Instagram and it has proven incredibly popular. My intention was to get people to look a little bit closer at their own environment, so their back gardens, their school grounds, their community spaces, and see how those could be adapted and improved with more pollinating plants, with more food sources for the young, the larvae, um, nesting places, those sorts of things. What I got back were the most beautiful 
practical drawings. I was sat on my own. Um, again, we were in another lockdown period as these started to come in. I was opening envelopes and just holding and, and looking at the pieces was so amazing. But also everybody that took part shared what they'd done and they helped to raise the profile of the project and engage other people in the conversations that were happening. And Mary, thanks to her, was one of those lovely people that got involved and shared and then has taken this project over to um, America across the pond to include her own artist group, um, the Princeton Artist Directory, who also have created an enthusiastic, diverse and really creative response. It's heartwarming to see what they've come up with and how people have reacted to this. And I'm really grateful to Princeton Public Library for giving us the space to help widen the audience to this even further. I love sharing the connections, the conversations, the things that are taking place as a result of this project. It doesn't really matter if you can draw or not. We can all be inspired by just looking a little bit closer. Thank you, Mary. I'm Catherine Gowan. I paint in watercolor and draw in pen and ink. I focus on themes of natural history, primarily botanicals, insects, birds, and geology. My academic training is in biochemistry, but I took as many ecology and botany classes as I possibly could squeeze in. And as an artist, I'm self-taught. So I took a bit of a scientific approach to the Flight Path Project. When Mary Waltham brought it to us, I had just been reading a publication in the journal Nature that studied keys to pollinator success. The researchers had concluded that of all the perennial flowering plant species they tested, a combination of five of them attracted the most diverse population of pollinators to a garden. Those are Black-Eyed Susan, Cat Mint, Giant Hyssop, Flowering Sage, and Coneflower. So for me, the science had again suggested the art and off I went um, to set out to draw and paint those five plants. So on my strip, you see I put down several curving lines of genuine silver leaf that wrap around to both sides of the strip to suggest a thin filament connecting pollinator to plant. Then I drew the flowering plants using a Pigma Micron pen with a tiny tip so I could control detail and add shading. On top of the dried ink, I added some watercolor I like to use a small amount of watercolor because I like the appearance of the pen and ink coming through. In the remaining space on the strip, I drew in 19 pollinators, a bird, honeybees, flies, moths, and lots and lots of ants, which really are underappreciated as pollinators. I had a great time with this project and I wanna thank Louisa Crispin for bringing it to us and here in Princeton to Mary Waltham for making us aware of the project and inviting us to participate. My thanks to Mary Waltham for asking me to participate in this lovely project and to Louisa Crispin for conceiving of it. I have noticed for some years now that insects have been disappearing. While I'm happy for fewer mosquitoes, on the whole, I find the disappearance of insects every bit as frightening as I do the loss of the vast majority of lions and tigers, bats, rats, whales, coral, and cod. I chose to focus on water bugs because waterways and ponds have been disrupted every bit as much, if not more, than the pathways that the monarch butterfly follows during its migration. Water is the incubator for many insects and the place where many spend most of their lives. 
On my little concertina, I show underwater adult and larval insects on one side and overwater insects flying and walking on the other. On the former, I've included the Daphnia, a larval midge, a mosquito larva, sometimes called a wiggler, a crane fly larva, and the funny little back swimmer that almost magically grips the surface of the water from underneath. On the ladder above the water, I show a whirligig beetle, an adult crane fly, a mosquito, a water scavenger, a water strider, and one of the most, those spectacularly vividly blue British dragonflies in honor of Mary and Louisa. I hope you will all look for these creatures next time you're near a pond or stream, even a drainage ditch. Many are beautiful and all are interesting. Thank you very much. My name is Ellen Bede and I'm a multimedia artist with a degree in art, anthropology and international studies. I wanna thank Mary and Louisa for including me in this important project on pollen. I, my focus on this project was to include birds, bats, bees, butterflies, and beetles that pollinate the plants and responsible for bringing us food. They sustain our ecosystems and produce our natural responses by helping plants reproduce fruits, nuts and vegetables, oils and fibers, raw materials, and prevent soil erosion. This ecosystem requires our support by helping the scientists and research partners who are working on this. Okay, spotted lanternfly. I first saw this insect when I was out painting along the canal just north of New Hope, Pennsylvania. And I had never seen such a beautiful insect before. I thought maybe it was really precious and, or rare or endangered. I carefully picked up the one that I saw and walked around and showed it to my friends. Um, out painting and then carefully put it back into place. And then a few years later, I found out that it wasn't um, rare or endangered at all. It wasn't invasive. It had come into Pennsylvania from, from the far east and was uh, coming, was, was getting into surrounding states, Delaware, New Jersey. And then I started seeing, um, seeing it in my backyard and I started collecting them for my, my young students to draw and for me, me to paint. Uh, at one point, I saw little tiny bugs. I did, again, I didn't know what they were. They were uh, black with white spots and they had long legs and were dancing. And the children just watched them all dance and we drew and painted those. And those turned out to be nymphs of the spotted lanternfly. So this... Um, yeah, this this creature was was very is very beautiful. But now they were being told to to stomp it out to protect some of our orchards and gardens, uh, especially the fruit trees. Hi, I'm Karen Stolper, and many thanks to Mary and Louisa for this interesting project um, and one that really made me think. Um, it reminded me that I had only recently learned that not only um, are the population of fireflies dwindling, they almost don't exist on the West Coast at all. And this really shocked me since fireflies were a huge part of my childhood. They delighted and inspired me well beyond my younger years. And when I looked into why this was occurring, it was sad, but not shocking to understand that it's due to humans. Um, humans create pesticides, humans are responsible for urban development and light pollution, and all the other elements that are destroying our natural habitats. And um, this confirmation is everything that we're doing again, is a ripple effect throughout our environment, not just locally, but globally. 
we share our environment beyond the human world, but as humans, we're inhabiting it unequally, not thoughtfully, and definitely not carefully. So the intention of my work was to show um, humans and that almost in a way to superimpose them onto the environment the way we are dominating unequally into our environment, to show the effects in the landscape that are far reaching just because we happen to exist in it. And while we dominating, while we are dominating this natural world, um, really important elements of it are slipping away forever. Hello, I'm Libby Ramage, and uh, thank you, Mary, for bringing Louisa's project to us here at PAD in Princeton. It was a really cool project. I came across the digger wasp when I was doing research for um, an exhibit I was in called Animal Architects, and we were exploring uh, different ways that animals uh, created their habitat and how it interacted with us as humans. And I thought the digger wasp would be a, a sort of a I don't know, it just seemed to be a good shape and an interesting insect for this project because it doesn't create a nest. It, it burrows into the ground where it lays its larva. Usually in farms, it's a very beneficial insect for farms because the, um, the digger wasp eats or collects the katydids that destroy crops for their larva. The wasps themselves live on sap, so they're very beneficial, but they're very, very large, so they're kind of frightening. And I created, I Xeroxed the original digger wasps for my artwork that I did, and re it reduces in size in this uh, accordion that we made, so that it looks really big at first and frightening when you first see it, but as it gradually diminishes into its actual size, which is about anywhere from an inch to two inches, it's it sort of the, the point of my sort of size change was to show that something that looks really frightening actually is not and is very beneficial and we should protect it. We should protect this particular breed of wasp. They're, they don't sting unless they're attacked. They're very, very docile in, in the wasp family, unlike the hornet relatives. And they're extraordinarily beautiful with the golden and black striped bodies. My name is Maria Lobiondo, and unlike the wonderful artistic visions that you are seeing uh, that are part of the flight project, I'm not a visual artist. I'm a storyteller in the oral tradition telling folk tales. These tales have been told for generations upon generations. And when I first heard about the Flight Path Project, the first story that came to my mind was a story of African and South Asian roots called All Life is Linked. That's my name for it. And it just seemed a natural, um, although it's a more of an overview rather than a detailed view as some of the artwork shows. My storytelling journey began when I was pregnant with my youngest child. And my daughter, when she was a toddler and even till today, uh, was fascinated with frogs. So I learned a lot of frog stories. But this, sto this particular tale also has mosquitoes, which are often much maligned, but are needed for the balance in nature. And that's, I think, a message of this story that we as humans need to think about our relationship with nature. And I am grateful for this project that helps us think about that.
My name is Mary Waltham and I chose the rusty patched bumblebee. The rusty patched bumblebee has the doubtful privilege of being the first bee to be placed on the endangered species list in the United States. Its population continues to fall year on year. This bee species is, or rather was, native to the Eastern United States, including New Jersey, and was an excellent pollinator of wildflowers, cranberries, and other important crops, including plum and apple. Following petitioning by the Xerxes Society, B was finally classed as endangered in 2017. Reading more about bumblebees, I found this quote, Bumblebees are able to fly in cooler temperatures and lower light levels than many other bees, and they perform a behavior called buzz pollination, in which the bee grabs the pollen producing structure of the flower in her jaws and vibrates her wing musculature, causing vibrations that dislodge pollen that would have otherwise remained trapped in the flower's anthers. Some plants, including tomatoes, peppers, and cranberries require buzz pollination. Sounds like my sort of bee, ingenious and energetic. But how could I possibly express the value provided and the threat of extinction faced by these insect sets within the context of the Flight Path Community Project? Most people like fresh cranberries, especially later in the year, over the holidays. The rusty patched bumblebee used to be the primary pollinator in cranberry bogs in New Jersey. And yet it has not been seen in New Jersey since 2003. I hope the relationship between the bee and the berries provokes curiosity and connects viewers to the significance of this and other insect losses. Hi, I'm Meg Michael, and uh, my concertina design was inspired by my own garden and other plantings in my own backyard. I like to sit on my patio and watch the birds and the butterflies and other bugs as they explore the flower beds. Um, of course, hummingbirds are especially fun to watch flitting from one colorful flower to another, and then suddenly they're off lost among the leaves of my crab apple tree. As a member of a Garden Club of America Garden Club, I'm well aware of the importance of the many ecosystems that one can find on any given parcel of land. I know how important it is that we use native plants to provide a safe habitat and proper nourishment for the pollinators that are native to, to our area. I also took a closer look at my old well-established beds of ivy. While ivy has an insignificant flower, it quietly attracts many pollinators such as honeybees, ants, and wasps. And again, it provides the perfect habitat for them. And with that, you have a little but important part of the flight path. And it was an honor, thank you, Mary, to include me in this uh, fabulous project. Hi, I'm Mick Bokelman and my piece is titled Portals. By creating this for flight paths, I read up a little bit on honeybees. As we all know, they are endangered. Interestingly, I found out there are nine honeybee species. One is native to Europe and Africa. The other eight species are native to Asia and all are present in Southeast Asia. Simply, Portals reimagines a world where bees, other insects, and birds are provided an escape to the habitat they deserve. May they once again flourish without the threat of climate change, pesticide, and habit loss. My piece depicts two flowers I commonly use in my work, plumeria and jasmine, which is the national flower of the Philippines. There are cutouts throughout the folded paper signifying portals 
for insects to escape through. Thank you, Louisa and Mary, for introducing me to the Flight Path Community Project, which inspired me and others to learn more about our environment. Ryan uh, Lilienthal is unable to be with us this evening, so I am briefly standing in for him. The subject matter of insects, movement, change, and the struggle in nature resonates with Ryan's continuing fascination with Kafka's The Metamorphosis. In this case, I wonder how much human interruption with nature's harmony amplifies interruptions within the nature of our internal harmony. Wow, I'm going to give an applause to uh, that wonderful talk. And at this point, I would like to ask all of our panelists from the Princeton Artist Directory who were able to make it here tonight. And I'm really glad that actually Ryan was able to join us at the last minute. So please turn on your cameras and unmute yourselves and join us on screen. And what I'd like to ask our audience to do out there is to start entering any questions you might have, either in the chat or in the Q&A. And again, you can address your questions to a specific member and their work and what inspired them or anything about their methodology or just to the group as a whole, if you have a question. And, oh, look at that. We have a question already. Great. Um, uh, this is from Louisa. Actually, it is a comment. She says, this is absolutely wonderful. I can't wait to see these close up. The project appears to have made people think differently about their environment. So her she does have a question. I'm interested to hear if there's one action you have taken that is different since taking part in Flight Path. It need not be anything big, maybe just sitting and watching insects more. For me, since taking part, it's been about changing the way I garden and reducing my need to be tidy. So um, anybody want to say, is there anything that they had changed as a result of taking part in this project? I'll go. Um, so when Mary suggested this project, I was, um, I'm still listening to um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, and she's a Native American author and a botanist, and it, it also makes us aware of what's happening in the world. But um, after reading it, she, she asked, you know, what's one small step? And one thing she suggests was uh, making a garden or creating a garden. And I don't I, I'm, I don't have a green thumb, so I'm gonna try it this um, this spring. Okay. Okay, so Marie, so Mick is gonna start some gardening. Anybody else making any changes or observing more or anything? You can just hop right in or raise do the raise your hand if you want me to call on you. I think I've just become a lot more aware and uh, thinking much harder about what, what, what goes where and how, as you said, not being too tidy. Um, being too tidy is not great for our, anything. And I think I've tried hard to be less tidy. <laughs> um, Mick, we have a lot of people in the chat agreeing with you that Breeding Sweetgrass is an amazing book. And we do have that in the library collection. It was on um, every year when we do the Environmental Film Festival, we make a book list and I know it was on our book list um, one of the years. 
as one of our top picks for environmental reading. So glad that you're reading that. Anybody else want to hop in? I can't get on. Oh, Ellen, you're not on. No, oh, because we're missing somebody. You disabled. Oh, did I disable you? Oh, okay, Ellen, hang on. Well, we got your, let me do this. I think I can get you. There you go. Ellen, I've got you starting your video now. So sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> okay, Ellen is here. Thank you. Okay. Great to see you, Ellen. Oh, yes. I think this project was wonderful. And what it, my daughter has always been involved with insects and bugs and bees. And I've sort of ignored her, but now I've sort of looked at it again. <laughs> and I think this spring, what I'd like to do is maybe go to the Rutgers uh, Center and see if I can start planting some interesting pollinating bushes in, in my garden. Great. Well, we've got lots of questions piling up, so I'm going to move to the next one. Um, so one of these questions is uh, from Susan Miles is just saying this is a wonderful art form and asking if there's a follow up. And then she said, maybe with birds. And I'm going to answer that one because uh, Susan, it's funny that you should ask that. The library uh, during the whole month of February is going to be a center for the Great American the Great American Backyard Bird Count, which is actually celebrating its 25th year. And which is uh, over the weekend, we, everybody's encouraged to go out to their backyard and count birds and report back to the library through our app, which will then go to the Central uh, Cornell Orthonology Lab, where they take a census of natural birds. And, and, and they, they've been doing this for 25 years and getting pictures on that. We're gonna have a talk with the orthonologist from Cornell. But what we're also doing as part of that is we are asking our community members, and that's anybody on this call, anybody from young children to senior citizens, professional artists, amateur artists, to submit an eight and a half by 11, 11 artwork of a New Jersey native bird. And um, so I hope some people from Princeton Artist Directory will take part in that. Um, we're just going to encourage people to be looking at birds in their backyard. And then we're gonna have a, a digital art show on the library website and on our Flickr account of the artwork that is submitted by our community of New Jersey birds and celebrating uh, our natural birds. That information, the call for art is gonna be going out, I think at the end of this week or early next week. Um, if you want more details, you can email me, but we're gonna be all about the birds in um, February at the Princeton Public Library. Um, so let's go to another question that uh, somebody else can answer. But I, I mean, I guess, um, so uh, Judy uh, England McCarty wants to know from start to finish, uh, what was the time frame um, of this project for the Princeton Artist Directory Group? I guess that one should be answered by Mary since you're yeah, the um, coordinator. I, I came back from the UK and immediately met up with everyone. This would have been mid-October. And then rather brutally said that we needed we needed them back by early November because I wasn't sure when the library was going to be able to exhibit them. So everyone had three weeks, not long, mm -hmm. and sort of had to get on with it. And then we met back at the library and everybody brought their pieces. We didn't, we didn't talk to each other really about what we were doing. We all went off and did it and then came back. So it was a three week period. And um, Louisa, I know who's on the call, she, she's, she was sending out um, these, you know, she was sending them out by mail in the UK and then she put in a, she had a deadline and people would miss the deadline and she'd still accept them and they still wanted them. So she has much more experience than me of, of how long people take, but it, it can be quite short as we proved. Yes. And uh, yeah, so we'd hope to put it up in December at the library, but um, you know, with the surge and changing environments um, of COVID, it went up in January, which I think is actually great to have it up. I, um, so. I must also say part of the planning was figuring out how we were going to display it in the library and the location. And um, we came up with, I think, a really unique way to do it with the clothes pins and the clothes line. And um, Mary built this, or Mary's husband built the uh, stand. Is that correct, Mary? Correct. John Hopfield built it. John, yes. Built a customized display unit. Um, so that we could put it out and people could see both sides of the pieces and um, it's very well done. Yeah. yeah, I think it's unique. Um, okay, so here's a question. Um, 
uh, to tell us more about the importance of eco art as a movement. And um, I guess anybody on this, but maybe I know Mary does a lot of eco art, but is anybody else that, you know, eco art is a movement? Anybody want to uh, address eco art? And that was question was from Andre. Yeah, Charlotte. Yeah, um, this is one form of eco art, illustrating nature and, and natural issues. Uh, I, um, my interest has to do with plastics and waste. And so I have several projects going involving um, bottle caps and trying to help people understand that even a very small uh, piece of litter can have a huge impact on the environment. It's another uh, aspect of eco art. So I'm sorry, I don't have a, a photograph to share handy. But we do, if you go to the library's website where we have the exhibits listed or you visit the exhibit, you can find um, all of the different artists, uh, Instagram handles and websites so you can visit and view their work. Um, Maria. Amy, let me jump in there. The um, National Storytelling Network is doing a conference on, um, er, it's called Earth Up. So storytellers are also mm. very involved in echo art and uh, raising up different ways of making us all aware of nature. Okay. Um. So here's a question. There's a couple of questions. Um, well, Louisa Crispin said that a nursery school took part in the UK. It was wonderful to watch um, a video of them taking part. Um, Sarah had wanted to know earlier on whether or not, um, had said it's a delightful project. Um, have you put together a packet for teachers so they can bring it to their classroom? And so I guess we've had one uh, nursery school in the UK take part. Um, so, Louisa, you can put in the chat, is, is there gonna be some kind of packet? I do think this would be great, great. Um, to go into schools. I said, do you think this project would be able to be duplicated in schools? This is from um, image brim to everybody to raise awareness among the younger generation. And if so, it, what advice would you give to get uh, things started with kids? So maybe someone who on this call who took part in this and we, um, if you were doing this with kids, how would you get them started with this? Anybody on here want to tackle working with kids to do an art project like this? Yeah, Libby. I, I, I work at a preschool uh, mm. twice a week doing art. And uh, the teachers that I work with um, regularly take the children. I mean, it's sort of in a neighborhood. It's not rural particularly, but they take the children out to observe their neighborhood and to collect leaves and anything that they find along the way. And they bring it back and discuss it. They do it every season they do it in the fall the winter and the spring and the summer and it makes the kids more attuned and aware to things around them other than their homes or the cars it's the nature of what's what's right in front of them all the time it's very helpful and we try to make art projects from some of the stuff they bring back um so louisa has put in the chat that she's working on plans to expand the project and will be looking to take it to more schools it certainly helps to give a focus to nature time for students. And um, we had another comment in the chat from Susan Miles about, of course, we had the notable insect event in Princeton this year <laughs> with, the, <laughs> with the return yeah. of the 17-year uh, cycle of the cicadas, um, maybe a project in that amazing phenomenon. Um, but I guess they're not going to be back for 17 years. So thank goodness, in my opinion. I'm, I think they're quite beautiful, but when you have to walk to work and they're falling on your head, maybe not so much. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, someone here put, um, they were hoping for Maria to tell her story. Maria. Uh, I, I could do that. It's very short. Okay. Um, so it, it, is, uh, it is my version of this particular story. Um, there was a village chief who did not brook any disagreement to anything he wanted. Now his village was near a marsh and the villagers often slept to the sound of croaking frogs. One night, the chief 
woke up and he couldn't go back to sleep and blame the croaking frogs for keeping him awake. The next morning, he called everyone and said, we have to exterminate all the frogs. And because people were afraid of him, they didn't want to say that they wouldn't do it, except for one advisor who said, all life is linked. What does that mean, said the village chief. Go and do what I said. And everyone else did. And so the night after that, it was very quiet. And the night after that, and the night after that. But eventually, a new sound came of buzzing and biting and swatting and slapping because mosquitoes were out of control without the frogs to eat them. And so the chief called for them to go out, the villagers to go out and exterminate the mosquitoes. Again, that one person said, all life is linked. I don't know what you mean, go kill those mosquitoes. And so everyone else went out, but of course, it's very hard to kill all those mosquitoes. And so the villagers left one by one by one until only the chief was left in the village. And only then did he understand what was meant by all life is linked. Very good. Well done. On this, putting you on the spot and you came <laughs> through. Um, so I just want to go around kind of like what we call popcorn round robin style to each of our panelists. And just um, if you want to tell us um, what you're currently working on, um, what's your biggest project right now, if you have one, or if there's just something that you're focusing on in particular, or if you have an exhibit coming up. Uh, so we're going to start, uh, I'm going to go by my screen, I'll just call on you. So we're going to start my, my upper left, which is Charlotte. So Charlotte, uh, if you're working on a project right now, anything news that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, no, I don't have audience worthy news. I just uh, moved to a new studio and I'm trying to get set up to get back to work again. So thanks for asking, well, sorry. A new, a, new, a new studio is exciting. Um, it's very exciting, delightful, especially now that we're stuck indoors again for a while. Yes, congratulations <laughs> on the new studio. Well, we'll look Thank forward you. to some work. And um, I'm gonna maybe uh, touch base with you about your work with the plastics. Uh, because we wanted to do something with that this summer when we're doing um, Oceans of Possibility of our huh? reading, summer reading theme. And we want to look at, especially about the harm of plastics to our oceans. Perfect. So, yes, great. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, Meg, how about we have you go next? Hi, well, um, I'd say I don't really have anything newsworthy either, except that knowing that we're heading into a, a period of isolation again, um, I've been uh, going through photographs that I take throughout the year and often during the periods of cold weather, I use photographs as um, inspiration for paintings. So I'm about to start a landscape painting and uh, we'll see. Great. Okay, uh, let's have Ryan go next. Thanks, Jamie. And Mary and Luis, thanks so much for the project. And thanks for subbing in for me, Mary, on the uh, video. I, I, I appreciate it. It. I, it, was, it was rubbish. I'm sorry. It, it, <laughs> not, it was not rubbish uh, at all. Um, and I appreciate it. So um, I'm back in school. Um, I'm working on an MFA in design at Rutgers. It's a new program that synthesizes the creative design process with research interests and, um, and technology. And so my research interest is in the area of memory. But I became interested in the idea of this type of program um, coming out of a, um, an exhibit that's still up at the, at the UU, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation, addressing the Mueller Report. Uh, I figured that a, 
a series of artwork would force me to read this critically important document that's, that addresses the foundations of our democracy. And it started off as a painting project and um, developed into um, pieces that involve technology and related to, to this work. And this is a question that I had in terms of reaching out to students because I think that's a great idea is I enjoyed kind of responding to the, the um, graphic designs that were on um, the um, concertinas. Um, and in a way, the, what I do with the Mueller report is respond to the text, the redactions, the revealed text, and the redacted text, what's, what's, what's uh, transparent and what's opaque. Um, and um, so there is that type of interplay um, with this project too. Anyway, that's what I'm working on. Great. Well, congratulations on going back to school and, and pursuing some further development for your career. Uh, that's great. Um, so let's go next to uh, Maria. Um, well, actually, uh, I am doing something environmental. I'm also a coordinator of the Princeton Storytelling Circle, and we are going to be putting together a, uh, a video of environmental stories that we hope will um, be compiled by Earth Day in April. Uh, individual storytellers who are members of the group will each tell a story and we'll put it all together. And uh, it'll be, we're looking forward to, to doing that group project. Great. And then let's have Libby. Um, I've got some work in a group show at the Alpha Art Gallery in New Brunswick that it runs through this Saturday. It's called uh, Mirror to the World and it focuses on watercolor and mixed media for what that's worth. But what I'm working on now is uh, something that's interested me called uh, Rules of the Game where I'm using actual game rules and how that reflects uh, the, our society and how it affects people in our society, our rules and our, how games reflect that. And I'm, that's what I'm using in my artwork right now. Great. And uh, Mick, I know you're just off a of residency and had some done some things this fall. What's up your sleeve? Well, I just went through a major renovation for my art studio, but um, it looks nice, but I have a lot of piles lying around. So I need to organize. It's a little bit, little bit of a mess, but I am continuing to experiment with manila envelopes. The flowers that you saw in my concertina were made out of manila envelopes. And if you go on my Instagram, it's at Mick Bogleman, you can see my daily experimentations. Great. Yeah, I've noticed that you're getting, as I said uh, earlier when we were in the green room, that you're getting a lot more 3D. Uh, Mick had a show at the library this summer and it was a lot more flat. And I've noticed now that you're expanding since your residency and, and taking a lot more um, 3D effects. Uh, Mary, what's up your sleeve now that you've coordinated, a, now that you've rounded everybody up on Princeton Artist Directory for this show, which I think was, by the way, Mary, thank you. I mean, Mary, you've done an incredible amount of work to get this up. I mean, hats off to you. you. So what's, what's up now, Huge what's your pleasure. personal? Well, yeah. me, for me, my studio is the outdoors. So this time of year is a bit tough. However, my latest passion is taking natural materials, soil, ash, uh, charcoal, those kinds of things, and incorporating them into, as I'm trying to abstract the landscape, that's a big mouthful, but that's really where my practice has gone in recent years. And so right now, I'm really clued into New Jersey soils, and I've been in touch with a geologist who is at the New Jersey, New Jersey Soil Survey, who knew we had one, down in Clinton, <laughs> who has told me exactly where to go to get all these different colored soils. I'm building a palette from New Jersey soils. It's very mm -hmm. exciting, really, really interesting. And um, I hope to have something to display, to exhibit before long. But thank you for asking. Thank you, Mary. And Catherine? Yes, I have a number of things going on. I just completed a botanical watercolor of purple lovegrass, um, or grass spectabilis for uh, the Sourlands Conservancy. So it's a project um, where botanical artists donate for the benefit of the conservancy. So they will auction them off at some point. So this was a rather large piece, about 20 by 30 inches. 
Um, and this is one of the larger pieces that I've done. I generally work a little bit smaller than that, always botanical watercolor. Sometimes I include rivers. Um, I've included the Little Colorado and some, um, uh, not, not in the Sauerlands piece, obviously, but in other pieces um, for desert, also desert plants. Um, and I keep a botanical journal um, where I use pen and ink, similar to what my concertina piece was. Pen and ink and I add watercolor. Um, and I love the winter plants, so I'm always out. I'm right now working on um, uh, walnut ink pieces, uh, sort of in the old master's style um, of drawing um, on parchment colored watercolor papers, tone papers. So um, win winter is my favorite time. There's such beauty in the winter landscape and the dried seed pods. So I'm enjoying that. Oh. Nice to meet another lover of winter here in New Jersey. I, <laughs> um, I winter is my favorite season as well, and I don't often meet somebody else who loves winter as much as I do. <laughs> okay, and Ellen Reedon, you want to uh, share with us? Well, I don't have a botanical or a you know a naturalist background. Uh, I really uh, have have been an artist since I was in graduate school a hundred years ago, and most of the work that I've done and maybe in the last 10 years have been landscapes, sort of inspired by the landscapes around here in this area. But now I'm starting to add people into my landscapes. So it's becoming very interesting. And I have an opportunity to have a show in New York. So I'm, I'm looking to, you know, get that together. Great. Wish me luck. Well, you'll have to let us know when your show goes up in New yes. York and where it goes. Well, and so We've, we've had all the questions come in. We've had quite a bit of chatting. And so I'm going to just close things out here with a few things. Um, one is um, to say that um, the pollinator, this is actually this little miniature flight path pollinator exhibit on the first floor. Um, as I said, we're going to be doing the, the birds in February. Um, and then in April, uh, starting April 1st is our um, 16th annual Princeton Environmental Film Festival, um, which we have won many awards for where we screen environmental films. It's gonna be a hybrid event. Some of them will be able to be viewed online, even if you're from anywhere in the world. So Louisa, that would include you um, through a platform called Eventive, which is how we've done the, the festival since we went um, to pandemic mode. But we're also gonna be bringing back some in-person screenings um, either on campus or at the Garden Theater as we can. Um, and with, along with the Environmental Film Festival in April, we're gonna be putting up uh, an exhibit that's coming from the Smithsonian. And it's all about pollinators because down in DC, there is a pollinators garden as part of the Smithsonian. It's really, really beautiful. And they've created a traveling exhibit that can be hung that is bilingual. Um, it's 16, um, it's, it's in Spanish and English. And it talks all about the different pollinators um, to kind of expand people's minds beyond thinking about bees as the only pollinators, as does Flight Path. I mean, I think that's one of the things I really liked about Flight Path was that everybody took, you know, different insects that are a part of this. And I think people just think of, oh, save the bees. Um, it's save all the pollinators. And um, it's also providing a habitat for pollinators. Uh, so we're going to be trying to do um, a, a plant wildflowers campaign around this time and working with um, some different groups in the area to do some nature walks and bio blitzes. So that's all coming up in April. So we'll encourage you to come back and be in part of that. And then finally, I'm going to put in here the link to the library's exhibit um, page on our website. If you scroll down, you'll be able to have, have the links to each of the artists who are here on the talk tonight, as well as those that there's one or two that were unable to make the talk tonight. So you'll be able to see the information um, about the flight path and the artists in it. And, uh, but also you'll see the two new exhibits that I was at the library today working to hang up that went out um, live today. Uh, we have some quilts up to warm up the library for the winter. And we also have um, some photographs of backyard birds that all the birds the photos up of birds were taken here in Princeton by a uh, local photographer um, who, um, so that they're up in the technology center. So you can go and look at that. And I just want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Mary for wrangling us all together. And um, 
So we also have here a thanks coming in from Louisa Crispin saying, thank you all so much for taking this project to new levels. And especially thanks to Mary for all her hard work in coordinating this. The project was started with an artist group based at a small library gallery museum complex in the UK. And it's fabulous to see it connected across the ocean to the Princeton Artist Directory and to the library there. And I agree, I think that bringing this project international, I feel very proud that the library could be a part of this. And I'm so thankful to Mary for allowing this. And hopefully this will also bring up some more satellite sites around the USA once we get this video out on YouTube. Yeah. And hopefully we can have other satellites maybe in Canada and maybe in Australia and maybe in the Philippines, Mick, you can <laughs> encourage people. We have people clapping. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, so this will be going up on the library's YouTube within a couple of days. And I'll look, you know, you can go check it out there. Send the link around. We have lots of Bravo alls coming in through the chat, which is so lovely. So with that, we're all going to wave good night. And thank you for attending tonight's art talk here at the Princeton Public Library. Thank you all. Thank you, thank Jamie. You very much. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mary. So helpful.